Welcome to Real Life. On today's episode, we're looking at the 1937 Ohio River flood, specifically the immediate aftermath in Louisville, Kentucky area. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I'm looking forward to sharing this interesting but heartbreaking historical film with you. The Ohio River flood of 1937 happened in late January and February. With damage stretching from Pittsburgh to Cairo, Illinois, 385 people lost their lives, 1 million people were left homeless, and property losses reached $500 million. Federal and state resources were strained to aid recovery as the disaster occurred during the depths of the Great Depression and a few years after the beginning of the Dust Bowl. The flood surpassed all prior floods during the previous 175 years of modern occupancy of the Ohio River Valley. The overall scope of the flood surpassed the major floods of 1884 and 1773, and geological evidence suggests the 1937 flood outdid any previous flood. 70% of Louisville was submerged, forcing 175,000 residents to flee. 90% of Jeffersonville, Indiana was flooded. At Louisville, the crest of the flood is still a full 10 feet higher than the second highest crest set in 1945. At McAlpine Lock, the 1937 flood crested at 85.4 feet. By way of comparison, flood stage is 55 feet. Louisville received 15 inches of rain in only 12 days, from the 13th to the 24th of January. Over 19 inches of rain fell over the course of the month. No measurable snow fell during the entire month. The United States Weather Bureau, now the National Weather Service, at the time was located in the Lincoln Building at the corner of 4th and Market. A handful of powerhouse radio stations, including WLW and WHAS, quickly switched to non-stop news coverage, transmitting commercial-free for weeks. These broadcasts consisted mostly of messages being relayed to rescue crews, as many civil agencies had no other means of communication. The painter Thomas Hart Benton was commissioned by the Kansas City Star and St. Louis Post-Dispatch newspapers to provide sketches depicting the miserable conditions of the flooded area in the Missouri Boothiel region. When it became obvious that the river would cut the electricity to radio station WHAS, thus cutting the last radio voice to Louisville, the rival station in Nashville, WSM, picked up WHAS's broadcast via telephone and broadcast emergency flood reports for three days for the lower Ohio River. Other stations across the country did much the same. In January 1937, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, District Engineer Major Bernard Smith, dispatched an entire fleet down the Cumberland River for rescue and relief work in response to the severe flooding. The bridges were too low to allow the vessels to pass under, so the vessels were forced to steam across farmland and bridge approaches, dodging telephone and power lines. The federal government, under President Franklin D. Roosevelt, sent thousands of area WPA, or Works Progress Administration workers, to the affected cities to aid in rescue and recovery. It also sent supplies for food and temporary housing, and millions of dollars in aid after the floodwaters receded. The scale of the 1937 flood was so unprecedented that civic and industrial groups lobbied national authorities to create a comprehensive plan for flood control. The plan involved creating more than 70 storage reservoirs to reduce the Ohio River flood heights. Not fully completed by the Army Corps of Engineers until the early 1940s, the new facilities have drastically reduced flood damages since.
In the 1930s, the Tennessee Valley Authority sought to create a continuous minimum nine-foot channel along the entirety of the Tennessee River from Pataka to Knoxville. The authority had also sought to help control flooding on the lower Mississippi River, especially in the aftermath of the Ohio River flood of 1937, as research had shown that 4% of the water in the lower Mississippi River originates in the Tennessee River watershed. TVA surveyed the lower part of the river and considered the Aurora landing site, but eventually settled on the present site at River Mile 22.4. The Kentucky Dam project was authorized on May 23, 1938, and construction began July 1, 1938. Much of the work of the Tennessee Valley Authority in the Tennessee River Basin was strongly supported by the majority of citizens in western Kentucky and their representatives in the United States Congress. U.S. Senator Alvin W. Barclay of Pataka and U.S. Representative William Gregory from Mayfield and his brother U.S. Representative Noble Gregory from Mayfield, who succeeded him in office, strongly supported the funding of the TVA and its role in addressing flood control, soil conservation, family relocation, recreation, production of electricity, and economic development. Six to twelve inches of rain fell in Ohio during January 13th to 25th. Totals never before or since equaled over such a large area of Ohio. January 1937 remains as the wettest month ever recorded in Cincinnati. 100,000 people in Cincinnati were left homeless as the flood affected the city from January 18th to February 5th. The river reached its peak on January 26th at 79.9 feet, more than 25 feet higher than flood stage. Ohio River floods on January 26 to 27 were the highest known for Gallipolis downstream past Cincinnati. Crests were 20 to 28 feet above flood stage and 4 to 9 feet above the previous record of 1884. 12 square miles of the city was flooded, the water supply was cut, and streetcar service was curtailed. Among the flooded structures was Crossley Field, home field of the Cincinnati Reds baseball team. Additionally, the amusement park Coney Island was submerged, causing pieces of carousel horses to float away, which were recovered as far downriver as Pataka. At Portsmouth, the rising river threatened to top the flood wall, erected 10 feet above flood stage. City officials deliberately opened the floodgates and allowed river water to flood the business district 8 to 10 feet deep thus preventing a catastrophic breach of the flood wall. The Ohio River eventually crested 14 feet above the top of the flood wall. Ten people died, many fewer than the 467 killed in the floods of March 1913. The river rose to a record 53.74 feet, which was 19 feet above flood stage, and sent water over the six-month-old riverfront plaza in Evansville, Indiana. The city and state declared martial law on January 24th, and the federal government sent 4,000 WPA workers to the city to assist rescue operations. Residents were rapidly evacuated from river towns by train and bus in the early stages of the flood making Indiana the only state to avoid drowning fatalities. More than 100,000 persons were left homeless by the disaster. The WPA workers led the cleanup of the city. The Evansville Merchants Retail Bureau took out newspaper ads to praise their work. Before and during the flood, these men of WPA were active in salvaging property and saving lives, and immediately afterward, they handled the cleanup job with such efficiency that many visitors were amazed that there was practically no evidence of the flood left throughout our entire city. All honor and gratitude is due to the rank and file of the WPA for their often almost superhuman efforts, always giving their best in the interest of humanity. The Red Cross and federal government spent the equivalent of $11 million in today's money to aid the city. The Indiana State Flood Commission was created in response, and it established the Evansville Vanderbilt Levee Authority District, which built a system of earth levees, concrete walls, and pumping stations to protect the city.
Jeffersonville welcomed the 1,000 WPA workers who came to rescue the city's residents. The federal government spent half a million in aid there and 70,000 in New Albany. The Pennsylvania Railroad evacuated many area residents by train from its depot in Jeffersonville. Several small riverside towns, such as Mockport and New Amsterdam, were so devastated that they never recovered. Harrisburg, Illinois suffered flooding from the Ohio River in 1883-1884 and again in 1913. Its most severe flood was in 1937 when much of the city, except Crusoe's Island, was underwater. Floodwaters reached nearly 30 miles inland and Harrisburg was nearly destroyed. Afterwards, the Army Corps of Engineers erected a levee north and east of the city to protect it from future floods. The levee has become the official northern and eastern borders of the town. Rural Pulaski County was functionally left an island by the rising portions of the Cache River, which near its mouth flowed in reverse as the Ohio floodwaters forced their way along the Cache to the Mississippi River above Cairo. The majority of county residents were driven from their homes, while the Riverside County seat, Mound City, was entirely flooded, with the shallowest locations still lying under 12 feet of water. Cairo itself was saved only by low water levels on the Mississippi River, which rose only to the highest spots in the levee without surmounting them. The historic city of Shawneetown was completely inundated and the residents were forced to move to a tent city on the outskirts. Property damages in the southern Illinois region amounted to more than $75 million. Over 300 bridges were smashed, six schools were ruined, and 1,200 homes submerged. Floodwaters were recorded at 65.4 feet. Damage in Shawnee Town was so cataclysmic, the town relocated three miles inland to higher ground. Several businesses in the Louisville area were devastated, especially the famed Rose Island Amusement Park on the Indiana side of the river near Charlestown, which was never rebuilt. As a result of the flood, newer development in Louisville was directed to the east, out of the floodplain. The east end has since benefited by a long-term concentration of wealth among residents and businesses which located away from the older central and western areas of the city. At Pataka, the Ohio River rose above its 50-foot flood stage on January 21st, cresting at 60.8 feet on February 2nd and receding again to 50 feet on February 15th. For nearly three weeks, 27,000 residents were forced to flee, staying with friends and relatives in higher ground in McCracken County or other counties. Some shelters were provided by the American Red Cross and local churches. Buildings in downtown Pataka bear historic plaques that note the high water marks, and at least one historic marker indicates the farthest inland extent of floodwaters in the city. With 18 inches of rainfall in 16 days, along with the sheets of swiftly moving ice, the 37 flood was the worst natural disaster in Pataka's history. Because Pataka's earthen levee was ineffective against this flood, the United States Army Corps of Engineers was commissioned to build the flood wall that now protects the city. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and will join us again. If you have any corrections or details that I overlooked, please let us know in the comments section. And if you really enjoyed it, subscribe to help support this channel. See you next time on Real Life.